So welcome to Talk Pompeii. I'm Brad Crittenden. I'm with the Canadian Association of Pompeii. I'm super excited that John Crowley is joining us today. In 1998, John's family was touched by Pompeii disease, which, which obviously motivated him. Among other things, John is the chairman and CEO of Amicus Therapeutics. He's also worked with organizations like Global Genes and the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America, which is pretty cool. John and his family's story have been told in books and even inspired the big screen. Thanks for joining us, John. Great, Fred. Great to be with you and everybody. Thank you. Um, I'm sure there's some people that, that still aren't actually familiar with your story. So could you just touch on that and briefly describe Amicus Therapeutics and how the company has grown since its inception? Sure, happy to. I, you know, like many of us, we came into the world never having known anything about or even heard of Pompeii disease. And for us, it was a, a Friday the 13th in March of 1998 when we were told that our then 15-month-old daughter, Megan, had Pompeii disease. And the doctor described it, talked about the glycogen, the buildup in the cell. I mean, literally re reading from a medical textbook. And uh, I remember asking him, is it serious and he said yes it's very serious and at the time she seemed to present with a, a more classical infantile form of the disease and he said she wouldn't live to be two and he then looked down at our son Patrick who was with us for the visit uh, in his car carrier uh, Patrick was seven days old and he said he needed to be tested of course there was a 25 percent chance he would have it and we did, and, and he did have it as well. Thankfully, our older son, John, was spared from Pompeii. Um, so we were thrust into the world of, of medicine and research like all of us in the community. And I think, you know, I, I think we went through the, a lot of the emotions, the, um, the, the fear, the anger, the uncertainty, all, all of that, and, and quickly settled on determination. And I think for us as a very young family, it was to, determined to keep our kids as alive, as healthy and as alive as, as we could, but also to learn everything we could about this disease and to see what we could do to change the course. And that led us into the world of medicine and science and really more out of frustration than anything. We uh, initially teamed with a, a brilliant researcher um, in Oklahoma, and that led to our first company, which was Novozyme, which was the kind of the basis for extraordinary measures. And you know, we were able to take that program and technologies and put it into Genzyme in 2002 and with a lot of people's help and effort and passion um, work to bring a first generation therapy, uh, enzyme therapy to patients. I left Genzyme in 2003 after the clinical research was well underway. And then for me in, in 04, I think, you know, after uh, six, 12 months on the enzyme therapy where the kids were getting, Megan in particular, getting stronger for a while. Um, their hearts were responding nicely, but then we realized we needed to try to do better. And that's when I had a chance to really step back, you know, that first company um, adventure really, uh, Novozyme was a blur and it was very sharply focused. And I thought we'd, you know, put a small dent in the Pompeii universe and, and move on in life. But then I realized, you know, there was so much need in Pompeii and would be for a long, long time. And more broadly across a lot of rare diseases. And so we came up with the idea for Amicus. We started with an initial focus on small molecule precision medicines, a technology that worked best in febre disease. We tried it in Pompeii and, and it didn't work well. Uh, which sent us back to the drawing board there to come up with newer, potentially better ideas. And for Amicus, you know, we, even in choosing the name, the, we, we picked the Latin word for friend. We wanted to be, you know, the, the most patient-focused, patient-friendly, patient-centered company in biotechnology. And that's been a journey now for nearly 16 years in building that company from a handful of us to now more than 500 employees and you know, great science and that patient-centered mind, really mindset more than anything. And, and that's really what I ask everybody at Amicus every day is to think if you had this disease, whether it's Pompeii or whatever disease they're working on, or you were the mom or a dad of a child with that disease, 
How would you think? What decisions would you make? Who would you hire? Where would you build a facility? When would you start a research program? Importantly, when would you stop a research program? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mindset. It's a, a very unique entrepreneur's mindset. And I think maybe that's what we're most proud of. So. That's, that's, that's really interesting. I, I was fortunate to actually uh, vi visit Amicus and talk to some of the people that you work with. And, and it was very, very inspiring. We really try to live it. You know, it's, it's um, uh, you, know, we, you know, we have a chief patient advocate, a C-suite level executive, Jane Gershkowitz, who reports mm -hmm. directly, sits on my eight person executive committee, attends all of our board of directors meeting, we all try to be, have that right uh, mindset, the right conscience. I asked Jane to really be the conscience of the company and her team. You know, the, with the patient lunch and learns, the patient advisory board started years ago, bringing in that mindset throughout the drug development process. Oftentimes before we even have a medicine in the clinic, it, um, it's, it's better for the programs, it's better for us in building a company, but it's also better for the patient community. Because most, most of the things we try, Brad, as you know, they, they don't work. Yeah. And we had that more than a decade ago in Pompeii with a pharmacologic chaperone, a small molecule monotherapy that given the nature of the genetic mutations in Pompeii, we just couldn't get it to work. But we didn't, we didn't stop. We went back to the drawing board. It took us a year of research and thinking, another five and a half years until we were able to get it into the clinic. Um, and now that's at the end of its, uh, hopefully at the end of its clinical development. So it's, there's a measure of persistence. If, if nothing else, we are a very resilient bunch. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. It, it's, it's essential actually. Yeah. Um, being a rare family yourself, you have a lot on your plate. How, how do you handle it all? You must have a lot of good people around you. Yeah, how do I handle it? Well, sometimes not well at all, actually. Um, we, we're blessed. You know, you got to think, Eileen and I were, you know, in our very early 30s um, when Patrick and Megan were died. Eileen was 30, I was 31, with three little kids, two of whom seemed to have this death sentence. And by the way, before they die, they were going to have really challenged lives. And it was a balance in those early days, um, a balance of giving them as normal, healthy, happy a life, celebrating the birthdays and going to the beach and being with friends. There are also extreme times, you know, weeks on end in intensive care units where you had to be laser focused on their health and well-being. And then there were times where it was learning about research and medicine and trying to develop a cure. And sometimes in those early years, I, I didn't get that balance right. Uh, I, you know, we. We tend to suffer our way to wisdom in life. And maybe over these years, we've, we've developed some measure of perspective, I think, maybe even more than wisdom. And, and really learn to just be grateful and appreciate every moment. I, you fast forward to where the kids are today. And look, they're still on ventilators. They're still in wheelchairs. And we have a, a team of family and support. And um, Megan's two closest cousins she grew up with. Uh, three closest uh, cousins, two became nurses and one is in medical school um, because of their, when they were 10 years old, they were bagging Megan and changing trachs. And it's just, you know, kind of the, the nature of, of everybody being involved. In and we were blessed, Brian, to have a wonderful team of nurses who help us care for the kids as well. And, and they're part of the family. Um, so we try always to be grateful. And I look out now at where the kids are you know, Patrick is 22 years old and works in a flower shop in Princeton, goes with his nurse. Even with COVID, they keep him protected and safe. And um, he finds deep meaning in that. And that's super important to have that sense of purpose and meaning for him, for all of us. And my Megan, you know, academically was so gifted and is quite, you know, so ambitious. Megan went and moved 700 miles from home after high school went out to South Bend, Indiana, to the University of Notre Dame, finished in four years with a double major, lived more, all of her more than 1,000 nights on campus in a dorm room, a handicapped accessible dorm room uh, in Ryan Hall at Notre Dame. Uh, we had nurses who helped her, her, but 
more than a dozen other students in her four years who volunteered to be there for wheelchair transfers, a second set of hands, showers. It was a remarkable effort by a community. And Megan graduated in 2019, and she's now getting a master's in social work at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. And she wants to be a social worker and, and work with, with children with uh, disabilities. So it's a great, great way to give back. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah. That kind of leads me into the, the next thing I want to talk about with, with treatment now. Many of these children are living to become young adults. And unfortunately, that didn't used to be the case. But now, now these, these young people are transitioning into adulthood, which can be difficult, especially when you have special needs. Now that you've gone through that with your children, uh, where do you think we're succeeding and how do you think we can do better? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting, the move to adulthood. It's not like you turn 18 and all, well, you were a child, now you're an adult. So now we have a new set of standards, care, whatever. It's this gradual transition. And I think, look, first of all, it's a blessing that with better medicines and care that children with Pompeii especially can now live to be young adults, hopefully old adults. Um, but it, it brings a, a new set of challenges for sure. Um, you know, you had, it takes years to get it right, but when you get the school environment right, it works beautifully well for for people living with, young people living with Pompeii. But when you lose that anchor of the school, then it's the kind of what's next. For Megan, it was college and graduate school and, and you know, onto the workforce she hopes and plans for. Patrick, you know, spent three years after high school in a transition program, and then he didn't want to go to college. And we asked him, okay, what do you want to do? You're not just going to sit here every day. And he said, I want to work. And so through friends and family and others, we were able to find an opportunity with a group uh, in New Jersey called Community Options that helps people with disabilities, special needs, find meaningful work. And for Patrick, he loved the flower shop. I never would have pictured Patrick working in a flower shop, but he loves it. He likes being part of a team and build something. And, you know, flowers, he says, make people happy. So that, you know, that, that's really special to see. So you've got all these challenges to, to adjust to, but I think you could also look at it kind of like we did or, or Patrick did and Megan too as, as opportunities. Okay, what's next? And you know, again, kind of the classic, don't tell me what I can't do because that's a really long list. Let's figure out what I can do. And it's, it's, it's interesting too with COVID, this is a really interesting phenomenon that we, it's like this great human resources is this great HR experiment has been thrust upon the world. And this, you know, are doing the, all these Zoom calls all day and working remotely for many, many people in, in business industry, not for profits. It's working. It's not ideal and we yearn to be together, but it's working. But it does show that we can have much more flexibility with our work environments and our workforces. And I think that is a unique opportunity for people living with disabilities where people living with Pompeii, maybe because of you know, day-to-day -day or day-long medical care, maybe because of transportation, commuting limitations, any number of barriers to working you know, so a traditional, in a traditional work environment, that's been shattered and I think in a very good way and it opens up a world of opportunities for everybody living with disabilities, special needs, especially with Pompeii, to contribute you know, so wonderfully to, to society. Um, and, and that, you know, as I think about the transition from childhood to adulthood, that I think is just a great, great opportunity. Yeah, I agree with you. And, you know, you, you mentioned how, uh, going through COVID now has kind of changed how we think. And Absolutely. it's interesting because I was on a muscular dystrophy call last night and we were talking about how having to change everything has affected, you know, charities because it's more challenging to fundraise, Absolutely. but how we, we've learned to do things differently. And sometimes they're better ways. Yeah, they absolutely are. Absolutely are. Yeah. yeah. Flexibility is so important. I'd like to talk about something that that uh, I think you and I are both very passionate about, and that's newborn screening. Pompey yes. disease was added to the to the RUSP in the U.S. in I think it's 2015. Same, but correct. there's okay, and there's there's still only about half of the states that are that are screening for it. In Canada, we don't at all. And in most other countries, we aren't. So how do you see us moving that forward? 
we we need to. And it's it's difficult, you know, in the United States, it's a state by state initiative. You can actually get it authorized, but then you also have to have it budgeted and paid for. So that's kind of, you know, a multi-step process. And then you're right, outside the United States, traditionally newborn screening has not been utilized. We are starting to see it. In fact, I you know, I think in Italy, I think it is, it's it's under consideration for a, a number of rare diseases for the whole country. So it's increasingly being adopted. We have to do that. You know, on one hand, we're, you know, we as a community are making better and better medicines. You know, eventually we'll have gene therapies. Um, I think I still think that's a long road, but um, eventually we'll have gene therapies. We'll have gene editing maybe someday, if, you know, and someday there will be a world where we can address Pompeii effectively, maybe in utero. And nobody needs to live with the, the challenges of Pompeii. Um, if that's the case, it would be a tragedy. And I think it's really then our, our moral responsibility as a society to find every person born with Pompeii disease, really any human genetic disease, and let them at least be aware of all of the treatment options and therapies. And if we do that, uh, you know, we, we could alleviate an enormous amount of human suffering. Um, and we can open up a world of better health and better opportunities. Um, but finding these children as quickly as we can, especially in a disease like Pompeii that is so relentlessly progressive to be able to intervene before you have substantial neuromuscular damage is gonna be critically important. Um, so I, I think it's a, a moral imperative. I remember talking with a physician about this a few years ago. And he felt that we were doing a, not a bad job of, of catching the infantile patients, which I don't agree with that we need to be quicker, but he, he thought we weren't doing too bad a job, but he thought that the bigger gain was probably for the late onset patients that have symptoms when they're, when they're children and they go through their whole childhood, you know, not being normal, um, even having trouble learning and, you know, and certainly physical activity can be difficult, probably bullying, you know, just a whole host of problems. I completely agree. So you think about for the adults, you know, coming with that diagnosis as soon as you can, and maybe, you know, maybe they don't need to be treated or shouldn't be treated early in life, but to follow carefully and to make just, I always believe that knowledge information is, is power. And the more powerful we can make Pompeii families, the better we will all be. So absolutely, you know, or and likewise, also to the extent that, you know, we not through just newborn screening, but the misdiagnosis rate for adult Pompeii continues to be unbelievably high. I believe there is dramatically more Pompeii. But I do think whatever doc you talk to, I think he's right. We're, we're not finding them fast enough and we're not finding them all, but we're doing a much better job than we did years or decades ago for young children, infants, young children with Pompeii. In the adult population, we're we have a long way to go. You look at people diagnosed with, uh, you know, limb girdle or Becker or, you know, any other muscular dystrophy or, uh, you know, we've seen Pompeii adults for years who were treated with for chronic fatigue syndrome, autoimmune disease. Uh, we've got to get those diagnoses right. Yeah, I agree. There does seem to be a lack of consensus on what to do with a late onset patient that's diagnosed at birth. Absolutely. Well, how, how, how would you answer that? I think, you know, here we, we're fortunate that we have such great experts, real true physician scientists in the Pompeii community. I think in, in, in a really exceptional way, Brad, where, you know, you, I won't name names because I'll miss too many people, but <laughs> doctors who, yeah, seriously, I, um, and then I'll get a <laughs> calls and text. But, that's, um, but, but they really are good human beings. Um, and I'm talking about dozens and dozens of doctors around the world. Um, who really care and understand this disease. And so, you know what, let's work with them, find these kids as soon as we can. And, and really, we'll, we as parents, you know, people as patients will become empowered, doctors will become more knowledgeable, we'll build a better body of evidence. And then we can decide it's ultimately going to be a drug by drug, patient by patient decision, and probably increasingly erroring on the side of treating early. Um, as long as safety looks good, probably treating earlier is, is always going to be better. Yeah. I think, you know, when we're looking at enzyme replacement therapy and there's that 
investment of time, you know, every two weeks or whatever the period is for the, you know, the family and the patient, that is something that they have to sometimes wrestle with. But the, the benefit is definitely there. And with other newer therapies coming on, it, 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 it'll just get easier. Agreed. Yeah. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't give you a chance to update us on, on the Pompeii program at Amicus. I, I did actually see a press release that came out yesterday, I, I think it was. So things are moving forward, which is, which is fantastic. They are. And look, we're really excited about our enzyme replacement therapy. Again, it's a, a novel next generation enzyme replacement therapy where we've, we've developed a cell line that has high levels of manno 6 phosphate. And the, you know, the targeting there is intended to increase muscle uptake in all muscles throughout the body. We also do the regimen also, uh, it is the oral administration about an hour before the infusion of a small molecule of chaperone. The idea there is that the chaperone will bind to the enzyme. These enzymes typically don't like to live in the blood. So it keeps it a bit more potent, a bit more stable, we think. Most of the new work, most of the work is done by the biologic, the enzyme that we've designed. Really happy with the results that we've seen to date. Um, we uh, expect in the first quarter of next year to have a large study that's uh, been conducted now in uh, over 120 adults, um, both treatment naive and ERT experienced patients in one trial. And we'll get the results. It's designed to show superiority to myozyme, lumazyme. And um, we'll look at six minute walk, we'll look at force vital capacity, a range of, of endpoints, we'll look at patient reported outcomes. So lots of clinical work. We're also now treating children down to age 12, uh, 12 in clinical studies, soon down to age two, all the way down to infants. In the meantime, we do have a compassionate use program where we've treated throughout the world um, uh, a number of infants with Pompeii. And, and we're encouraged by, by what we're seeing there as well. A lot of work, you know, with the manufacturing of this enzyme is incredibly complex. We've had really good results and success, and we continue um, to do everything we need to support our regulatory filings. The, the news you referred to is we began uh, uh, the first part of our BLA submission, which is the final approval, the licensing application. We began what's known as a rolling submission. Uh, last week, we submitted that to US FDA. We'll continue to fill in the pieces of that until it's complete in the second quarter of next year. So in the kind of April to June timeframe. And then, I, you know, hopefully it, 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 with strong data, we, we hope this has the real potential to become the next standard of care in Pompeii. So lots more work ahead of us, but we're really excited about where we are. And again, this is a, a, just maybe the best example in the company of everybody coming together for a very long period of time it is um, an intense focus for everybody at Amicus. And it also to make sure that we can get it approved around the world as quickly as possible. So that's our, um, our, uh, our late stage uh, enzyme replacement uh, therapy. We do have a gene therapy as well in, in preclinical development for Pompeii. That's awesome. That actually leads me into, into my, my next question. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about the the new Gene Therapy Center of Excellence in Philadelphia. That sounds very exciting. It is, you know, we made the decision um, a little over two years ago to invest substantially in gene therapy. It actually began, it was about three years ago when I, I met a child who was in a clinical study for spinal muscular atrophy type one, SMA type one. Deficit is very similar to classic infantile Pompeii. These kids almost never live past a year. They never walk. And the results were phenomenal. It became the second approved ever gene therapy. It's now a Novartis product. And I met a child um, in that study in their family. He was about a two, two and a half year old boy and he was walking and thriving. And he had received mm. therapy. And I can tell you, look, the gene therapy field has been littered with failures and challenges for many, many years. When, when, when Megan and Patrick were diagnosed, you know, I called, like many of us called a lot of doctors and I called one of the world's leading gene therapy experts who was working on Pompeii. And I asked a bunch of what were probably very naive questions, but I asked him the one we all ask, when can this be in clinical studies? And he said, a year, maybe two at the outside. 22 years later, we're still just on the cusp 
of getting these into clinical studies. Um, it, it's, it's, look, we have a lot of hope. We've, there's been a lot of success in gene therapy. There are still enormous challenges in the field. Understanding, you know, the manufacturing, the safety, incredibly important, not just the safety for an acute side effect profile, but remember for many of these gene therapies, particularly the AAB based therapies, most patients are only gonna have one chance in their life based at least on today's technologies to take a gene therapy. So it certainly better be safe, but it also better be pretty effective. And so we spend a lot of time um, thinking about for a range of programs, how do we make really safe, really effective, really novel gene therapies? With Pompeii, you know, the challenge is you've got to be able to express this enzyme through the gene therapy vector in all key muscles of disease uh, of the body. And you've got to do it safely. A high dose delivery of lots and lots of virus can be very dangerous. And we need to be very careful as a community about that. We partnered our uh, with Dr. Jim Wilson at the University of Pennsylvania. We opened that Gene Therapy Research Center of Excellence at the beginning of this year. It's 75,000 square feet of science and gene therapy work, including a lot of work with Pompeii Gene Therapy. We've seen some really promising early results with our, not, what we basically do at Amicus, we're experts in engineering enzymes, engineering proteins for optimal safety, uptake, efficacy, Jim Wilson and his team are experts at gene therapy. So designing next generation gene therapy vectors, which are the delivery mechanisms for the, what we call the transgene. Um, so combining these two teams and these two fields of technology has proven to be incredibly powerful. Um, so still, you know, reasonably early days for us in Pompeii, we've had some great animal results, preclinical results. We hope now to be able to move that into clinical studies and next year, we'll, we'll have a lot more to say about the timelines there. But for instance, in Pompeii, we're already working on the manufacturing technologies to make sure that we can make enough of it for everybody um, when we're comfortable that we've got something that looks to be safe and effective. That's incredibly exciting. You know, I, 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 from, a, you know, from a patient perspective, or I can imagine for a parent, just to see things advancing, even though they always take longer than we want them to, it, it means a lot. To see a lot of people involved in the field, all the academic research, the different companies that are involved. I welcome everybody into the field who wants to be a part of this. You know, we should have a, I hope, you know, Brad, I hope years, in the years ahead, that we have a lot more options and a lot more treatments and let doctors and patients decide based on scientific data, what's best for them. And that should be, the disease is the only competition. We, yeah, we, I completely agree. Truly live that, I hope. Well, John, <clears throat> thank you so much for spending this time with us. Yeah, it was great. And again, yeah. it, always, it has to be by Zoom these days, but nice, nice to see you. Yeah, you too. At least we have Zoom, right? <laughs> That's great. That could be a tagline <laughs> for COVID. At least we have Yeah. All right. Well, th thank you very much. Thanks, John. God bless. Bye-bye.